uh, settling down and having a spouse and then having a husband and then building towards the same life together. How can you help advise us within maybe five minutes, six minutes, on how to achieve this success together with each other? Isn't it? They always seem to be asking me the marriage questions. Mm. <laughs> I'll bring you on yourself, yes, sir. May Allah make it easy. My beloved brothers and sisters, it's not an easy topic. The more difficult we make marriage, the less barakah there will be in our lives. The Prophet ﷺ has asked us to make it easy for others. The Prophet ﷺ has asked those who have daughters and sisters and, and, and women in their guardianship to say, if someone proposes and comes forth with decent, reasonable character, reasonable deen, let it happen. The difficulty with us, we make nikah so difficult that we facilitate adultery and zina. That's what happens. We facilitate adultery because we don't realize that by making halal hard, you make haram simple and easy. By putting an obstacle in the face of halal, you are a vehicle and a tool of making haram something that is probably looked at as the only way out for the young. So when the mahar or the sadaq, as they call it, is very high, it becomes a problem. Yesterday, I officiated two nikah here in Abuja. I was the Imam officiating. I told them I don't want to know the Sadaq. They said, what do you mean? I said, have you agreed? Look at it. You agreed? We agreed. You agreed? We agreed. Witnesses, we have agreed? In the Sadaq? Yes. I don't need to know. It's not a competition. We don't want to tell people 50,000, 5,000, 10,000, 2,000, 1,000, or 100. I don't want to tell them. We say, have you accepted her in your marriage with the sadaq you have agreed upon in the presence of the witnesses? And the answer will come, yes, that's enough. But we make it a big thing in some communities. I'm not too sure about here, but I was just saying something that I know for many years. Some communities, they are excited to say, how much, how much was it, how much was it? They say, ah, 15 million. I say, what, 15 million? When I get married, it'll be 20. It becomes a, a competition. You know, the Prophet Sallam, he taught us not to be, you know, to try and have the least expense. Don't be extravagant. Don't set the bar so high that everyone needs to marry. You have to have this function and that function and before the marriage and during the marriage and after the marriage and so on. And you have to have a function here. Then you've got to travel to Jordan and have one there. Then you've got to go to America and have one there. All that cut it for the sake of Allah. You want barakah in your life? have a simple wedding where Allah and His Rasul are the main, main focus. Main focus. So people are saying, to talk to us about settling down. I've spoken to young, young boys here in Nigeria and a few of the, the, the girls that I've had the opportunity of uh, asking as well. The biggest problem is it's not easy to get married. That's what they say. It's tough. You know, we look for men who are wealthy already. And yet when we got married, there was no wealth in our pockets. Mm. Marriage age is once you're majority, age of majority, there's no fixed age in Islam to say you have to be this age or some. Once you, according to the norm of your society, are ready to get married, alhamdulillah, you're ready. Perhaps we would like to look at it anywhere between 18, 20, 21. There's no fixed age actually, but it changes with the changing of time based on several factors. At the moment, we're looking at approximately, I'd like to think 20 is a good age, but people might go a little bit this way, that way. That is an age that you are sexually perhaps at a level where you need the opposite sex now in your life, right? And to be very fair, you would not have even started a living, earning a living properly. To be very fair. Why did Allah keep it that way? that I need to marry at about 20, but I wouldn't really, so that the two of you can grow together, you can do ibadah together, you can actually uh, earn, you know, with one another's help and assistance in this way or that way, you can grow, and then you appreciate what you've earned, you appreciate the children you have, and so much more. That's one of the reasons. There are many other reasons, some we may know, some we may not know. But if Allah really wanted that a man must be very, very wealthy before he gets married, then the rule would be, 
that if when you are 20, you can only marry a man who's 70. That would be the rule. Because by that time, you have money. By that time, you are settled. You can spoil your, your wife. But Allah wants you to taste what life is all about. Allah wants you to go through the challenges. How many of the slightly older mothers that we have here, back in the day, they, they were struggling, struggling. I know in my own life, back in the day, you know, we, we didn't have it easy going. And over time, my parents didn't own a house for years on end. And even a car, it was something that came years later. And today a car is a condition of the children of the same people who didn't have cars. And a phone, wallahi, and everything. And you didn't, you know, you ask them, so when did you buy your house? They say, ah, 20 years after marriage, we afforded it. But my son-in-law, he needs two houses. Mm. One holiday house in wherever, and the other one here, and so on. And you need to have this and that. Come on, don't make it tough. So when you speak of marriage, you need a whole conference on marriage, actually. And I believe there's going to be one happening here sometime in April. Uh, a major international marriage conference of a very high standard is coming here. I think one ummah is partnering in that. So at that juncture, they will address this topic perhaps a little bit better. And there are going to be specialists from across the globe coming to talk about marriage here. I was just telling the brother today that I think in Abuja, they're going to need a whole 10 times this size when you're talking of marriage, because they are going to come. And one of the highlights of that is they actually do matchmaking, subhanAllah. They actually do matchmaking in a very professional way. I haven't seen exactly how it works, but I believe from some of my colleagues that it's done in a really professional way, properly done with guidance and guardianship and whatever. However, this topic, as you've seen, I've only discussed one aspect of it, and that is the aspect of making it easy. Together with that, you look at the divorce rate. How high is it? Extremely high. Extremely high. Today, someone told me that in northern Nigeria, divorce is extremely high. I said, stop blaming northern Nigerians. Don't say that. It's all over the world. It's not just unique to your place. Because we've become materialistic. We put so much pressure. And our focus is materialism. We've lost character, conduct, and we've lost the connection with Allah. So. On either side, we want, 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 want this, want that, want that. If it's not there, ah, I'm not happy in my marriage. Why? Ah, that uh, Gucci, he didn't even get it for me. I'm not happy in your marriage, Gucci. I, don't, I stopped wearing a watch. People say, you know, how come you don't, you don't wear a watch? I said, because I can tell the time from my phone. The phone has actually done us a lot of favors. You know that? This smartphone is really smart. You know why? You don't need a camera. You don't need a, all these big machines you see here. We can replace them with this little phone. You don't need a watch. You don't need a calculator. You know, so many things you don't need all on the phone. The sad thing is some people say, well, I don't need a wife also because on the phone. Audhu billah. That's wrong. So we need to know what we should be replacing and what not. But my beloved brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful topic. Let's develop our character. Many of us fail. When you get married, I challenge you to be the best husband you could ever be. It is worth it for one woman to say, what a lovely man. And for the whole world to think you're a nice guy, but they know who this guy is here. Behind the scenes, he's a real, you know, uh, problem. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. There's one quick point that I thought of regarding the previous uh, question that was uh, addressed to my colleague. You know, when your family gives you problems, for uh, as you become more and more religious. I've had people who've become Muslims and their families have not accepted it and they've been very angry and upset and what's the advice I give them? A lot of advice, but one quick point that, that will be helpful. Develop your character and conduct to such a high degree that in a short space of time, they will see this is the better person, a better version of the person than it was than they were before and they will begin to appreciate your closeness to Allah because some of us as we get closer to Allah we become arrogant we start saying to our own family members you you're going to Jahannam I mean who gives you the authority to say that if that is the case then you are a part of the problem piety and God consciousness comes with leniency and soft nature remember that you want to gauge a person's piety even your own Ask yourself, how lenient and soft have I become? And how do I address others and so on? Yes, when it comes to myself, I'm hard. 
I have to be hard. I'm going to try and do things proper. But for others, I'll talk, I'll try, I'll smile, I'll talk, I I'll try my best with this one, that one, etc., etc. And that's a sign of real closeness to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I'm really, really impressed by uh, the brothers and sisters who have attended all day today. And I'm really looking forward to tomorrow as well. And I pray that we have a very successful event. These events are a gift of Allah for us to go back and recheck and rejuvenate. And, you know, uh, like they say, when you've lost the path on a Garmin, you know, on the GPS system, the, uh, the voice says, uh, recalculating. Have you heard that? Recalculating. So we are here recalculating. If we've lost the path a little bit, we're going to take that U-turn and inshallah we're going to go back yes, to the right direction. May Allah grant us Jannatul Firdaus. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah ta'ala wa barakatuh. In the 21st century, you are not limited by your geographic location. With an effective use of media and the internet, you can speak to billions of potential customers at a go. Invest in advert and broadcast to generate brand loyalty and company traffic. iMedia Communications is here to help you produce and broadcast promotional videos for your businesses fashioned just for you. We offer services and video production to clients from startups to businesses, NGOs and government agencies with a focus on advertising, marketing and documenting. Contact us today to keep your business at the top of your customer's mind, attract new people and keep them up to date on your products and services. We are at the forefront of event coverage and live stream of your special occasions. When you think of video production and live stream, think iMedia. Contact us at www.imedianigeria.net or info at imedianigeria.net or dial 0810-450-8155 or 0816-681-5377. At iMedia Communications, we don't give excuses, we simply get the job done in style. Ali, Ustad Ali Amuda, he will address us, and then Mufti goes next after him, Bismillah. Alhamdulillahi wahdahu wa salatu wa salam ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Just a few minutes of your time, dear brothers and sisters, to introduce the concept behind this discussion, what will be a 3D dynamic discussion between us. Regret is one of the most painful emotions that can affect really any one of us, Muslim or non-Muslim alike. I was reading not too long ago in the Harvard newsletter of a man, an elderly gentleman in Liverpool from the UK who would pull out the same lottery number each week hoping to hit the jackpot. SubhanAllah, despite his old age, there is still that desire and the hope to become a multimillionaire one day without the need to work with it. And this is the nature of man, as the Messenger وسلم, said, that man grows and two things continue to grow with him forever. And one of them is the love of dunya. So every week he would come out with the same lottery number. And on one particular week, by the Qadr of Allah, he forgot to renew those numbers and his numbers came up. And so when he came to learn of this, he found no way to deal with the overwhelming sense of regret that he was engulfed by other than to claim his life. He committed suicide. It's a very sad story. We would have hoped that Islam could have been introduced to him before that so that he would find solace there. But this is the qadr of Allah Jalla Jalalu. The point being, regret is something that we really struggle to deal with. And had Allah Jalla Jalalu not given us the coping mechanisms to deal with it in the life of this world as Muslims, we could have been in the same situation as our friend from Liverpool. One of the Names of Yawmul Qiyamah, the day of judgment, is Yawmul Hasra, the day of regret. 
Allah says, وَأَنذِرْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ إِذْ قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Warn them of the day of regret. Warn them of the day of regret. The non-Muslim man will be in a state of regret for not being a Muslim. And the Muslim man and the Muslim woman will be in a state of regret for not being a better Muslim. We will be in a state of regret. With this short introduction, I would like to ask a question, which is, how can we protect ourselves from regret on the Day of Judgment? In other words, wouldn't it be so painful to meet Allah Jalla Jalaluhu on the Day of Standing, and to see paradise, and to see the hellfire, and then you see your deeds. And what was once the ultimate meaning of success in your life, you now see it nothing but a regretfully wasted opportunity. And that will be the situation of a lot of us. Imagine revising for two years, three years, four years, theoretically speaking, for an exam, and then when you enter the examination theater, you realize that you are revising for the wrong exam. Imagine spending four years, five years, eight years studying to become a professional in a particular field, say medicine or architecture, only to find out that there is no demand for your field of expertise. Imagine spending years upon years of your life climbing up a ladder only then to discover that your ladder was leaning on the wrong wall. Now, what is the common denominator of all three of these examples? I'm sure you will agree with me that it is vision setting. If I had set for myself a clear vision and a plan, knowing who I am as a male, as a female, educated, uneducated, Arab, non-Arab, knowing who I am and then knowing where I am going, I would have protected myself from such a regretful outcome. Agreed? Agreed, dear brothers and sisters? Tayyib, no. so what is success? All of this really is an introduction to get to this one question. What, what is success? How can I be happy and offer Allah Jalla Jalaluhu a gift, a dowry of a hasana, a good deed, to justify my pleading for Jannah? How? How do I define what success? Is it in being a CEO of a company? or a parliamentarian, or an MC, and there can be elements of success in all, don't get me wrong. I am talking about the ultimate success. That we are smiling on a day when the majority of people will not be smiling. How can we define success? Here is a suggestion, dear brothers and sisters, just to get the conversation going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us answer this question. Allah says, focus with me. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Every soul shall taste death. Allah mentions, and it is on the Day of Judgment, where we are going to be recompensed for what we did in full. Listen carefully now, here is the definition of success according to Allah Jalla Jalaluh. He says, therefore whoever is pushed away from the hellfire and is given access into Jannah, such a person has succeeded. What is success? It is about glorifying Allah and entering into Jannah. What is success? Not falling into the pits of the hellfire. With that benchmark, dear brothers and sisters, allow it to inform your decisions in life. Allow it to help you find your strategy on your project, so that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, us and our mothers and our fathers, and our children, will be smiling and will be happy, and we will not be in a state of regret. Sheikh uh, Ismail, tafaddal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in. I think very, very importantly, 
a purposeful life. Number one, we need to understand that primarily, as we always say, we worship Allah alone, we follow the footsteps of Rasulullah we must fulfill what Allah wants us to fulfill. Now, if we take a look at what Allah wants from us, we will realize there are two main things. Two main things that Allah wants us to fulfill. Number one is His rights, the rights of Allah. So I will worship Him alone as per the way He wants. I worship Him and I make sure that I don't go against His transgressions. He decides what's halal and haram. And I should be proud of being a person who is chosen to worship Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say proud here, we're talking of being happy. We're not talking of pride as in arrogance. But what's important to know is there will be challenges that we will face while we are trying to fulfill this duty. And these challenges are in the form of distractions in order for us to be tested who from amongst us is truthful and who is not truthful. So Allah says, do the people think that it's enough for them to say i'm a muslim and then they won't be tested allah says we have tested those before them in order to distinguish between those who are truthful and those who are not those who are false in that claim of islam islam meaning the submission so the second right or the second duty that we have one is worshiping allah one is the right of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second is the rights of the creatures of the same allah who created us so with me and with you, we tend to forget that Allah created others. Just like He loves me, He cares for me, He's going to provide for me, He will provide for them too. And He loves them and cares for them too, and He wants them to turn to Him as well. A person leading their life for 70 years in the wrong direction can make a move in one moment that would elevate their rank higher than a person who was in the right direction for 70 years and made a wrong movement. So while we are worshipping Allah, we must fulfill the rights of the rest of the creation. Why did Allah create people who are going to be disbelievers? Well, for them it's a test, but for me, it's an even bigger test. What do I do about it? There are some who, whose knowledge is lacking so much and whose patience lacks so much that they want to attack and harm those whom they disagree with. But Allah created them. When Allah speaks of the rights of neighbors through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu in the hadith, he tells us in his wording, he says, you know what? Your, your neighbor, if you believe in Allah in the last day, then don't harm your neighbor. And he speaks of the rights of neighbors who are Muslim, those who are not, those who are relatives, those who are near and distant, they all have rights. Your neighbor, a non-Muslim, your neighbor, a person who disagrees with you certain matters and their rights. Why? Because that's how you will get closer to Allah by understanding his power, his creation, his authority, his grandeur. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did Allah create the pig and tell us that it's haram to consume? Why? Why did Allah create uh, the dogs and the monkeys and tell us you're not allowed to eat those? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the snakes when they are harmful? Why did Allah create the lions and the tigers when we know that it's dangerous? For a purpose, for a reason. He's the same Allah who made me, so I need to respect the rest of the creation of Allah so much so that we as Muslims are not allowed to go out and start throwing stones at pigs just because they're pigs. We cannot just go and harm dogs just because they're dogs. No, they are the creatures of Allah. So this, that is one aspect of uh, our lives to understand the two uh, duties that we have. One is unto, well, it's all unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the rights of Allah and the rights of the rest of the creation 
and the rights more so of humankind as well. While trying to fulfill the obligations unto Allah, we will find that we will have, like I said earlier, distractions, obstacles, challenges, and sometimes when we don't control the heart and we don't realize that it needs to be put in its place, we tend to turn towards things that we're not supposed to turn towards because they are harmful. In the process, we tend to displease Allah. I'll give you an example. A person who's walking down the road and he sees someone with a beautiful motor vehicle and he really likes it and he wants it and he's so attracted by this beautiful car that he starts thinking for a month two months three months and then he realizes the best way of getting it is to steal it what happened he wanted something and he didn't control himself he wanted it so badly that he wouldn't he didn't mind to think of transgressing the command of Allah in order to get it that's one type of pressure so today we have drugs big problem huge problem people don't realize that in order to engage or participate or take those drugs people are transgressing Allah they're losing focus their their lives are becoming meaningless meaningless and yet they think that they are happy for a while because perhaps it's marketed in a certain way it's the in thing the same would apply to our identity as Muslims are we proud Muslims let's be honest today it's not so easy or it's not as easy as it was before to tell the difference between some who are Muslim and not whereas there was a time when it was quite simple to tell the difference it becomes so hard because why sometimes we are giving up this identity because of pressure pressure of what community society friends everything else the trends of today that we've seen on social media so we give up our identity as Muslims if that is the case we're losing focus the purpose of our life the entire purpose we're losing focus from it we're starting to focus on things that are not actually the purpose of life but they're supposed to be part of your living part of your making easy your connection with Allah we're clothed not not in order for us to transgress but in order for us to get closer to Allah Allah says well a verse with deep meaning we, when we dress there are two things bear Allah in mind be conscious of Allah when we're dressing and when you clothe yourself with piety itself then it's even better for you subhanallah so clothing yes while it is referring to that which is physical it has to do with our attitude it has to do with the way we talk and what else we do all that is part of taqwa it's like when Allah says Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna. when it comes to your spouses when it comes to your wives Allah says they are like a garment unto you it has a deeper meaning it doesn't mean that I take my wife and I wear her as a cloth as a piece of cloth no but it has a deeper meaning very deep meaning in the same way libasu taqwa has quite a deep meaning it's referring to quite a few things and what this goes to show Allah will allow us to enjoy things within this world for as long as we don't lose focus we don't lose focus of the main aim of our existence and this is what seems to be happening so in the next few minutes inshallah we will allow uh, you know discussion around this subject of the purpose purposeful life and living and there are many angles of looking at it Sheikh Ali looked at a beautiful beautiful angle of it and I've just put forward also a certain angle the challenges that we face while trying to live as Muslims living upright looking at society seeing your jobs I mean you get a job but to fulfill your salah is not a joke uh, some people say you know can I just go home and read all my four salah that I've missed because I was working I mean is it really that bad are you really compromising your akhirah because of the dunya so matters of this nature those who compromise their dress code their morals their ethics their values their duties unto Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, this age is an age of interest and usury. Is it, is it okay? Because, you know, like it's tough, you know. So can't I just X, Y, and Z? Well, to be honest, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. We do admit and agree that there are a lot of pressure, pressures, tremendous amount of pressure on our youth and on various other uh, categories of society. But we need to navigate through these tough times. And that's why we're here, inshallah, discussing this matter. So I'd like to, inshallah, ask the moderator to take over, inshallah. The question for Mufti is that uh, there is a conception that goes this way. Allah SWT has blessed you with wealth and he has blessed you with children and he has blessed you with many other beautiful things of this dunya. Almost in the eyes of people nowadays is translated to Allah being pleased with you. Now on the other side you don't have any of these things of, we've listed or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given you yet these things is also seen as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not being pleased with you. Setting a purpose for your life, how does it help this conception? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I had said earlier in one of the talks I mentioned, in fact the talk that I just delivered, I mentioned the point of how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli, he was not a wealthy man who had all the luxuries of this world, in fact he went through more than any one of us in terms of challenge. That's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us again through the blessed lips of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in what we know as hadith and I'm sure you know the difference between Quran and hadith they're both from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala one is sacred the word of Allah the other one is words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam given by Allah inspired by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and this is what we refer to when we say that Allah is telling us through the blessed lips of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the words of hadith uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, and it's just amazing, read these words and we understand them. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. When Allah loves a slave, he tests him or her. So when you don't have tests, Surely it should be reason to be a little bit concerned, to say what's going on, my life is a bit too smooth here. Because we will graduate one day and we will receive our certificates in a book form known as Al-Kitab on a certain day based on the results you will be able to get your ultimate dream of Jannah. You know, I would say, if you are at school, you get one examination every month. Nowadays, they have monthly exams, right? Then one in the term that's a bit bigger than the monthly ones. 
and the annual one which is bigger than all those put together, and then you have the qualifying ones which are at every interval, which are even bigger. And when you graduate from that school, you go to a higher school of learning, secondary, and the same happens there. And then you go into university, it becomes more and more difficult, but you're becoming more and more excited and you spend sleepless nights in order to get a certificate of the dunya, but you won't spend the sleepless nights in order to get a certificate of the akhirah. So as we proceed, we get a certificate with the idea of getting a job. And when we, we have to leave the schools one day and go into the real life. In the same way, we have to leave this testing ground known as the dunya and go into the real life known as the akhirah with the same certification. And we will continue and we will progress. And Allah tells us, the bigger the test, the bigger the reward. Amazing. The greatness of the reward is connected to the greatness of the test. Just like this world. If you were to sit in examination and the first question was one plus one, forget about that certificate. You don't need it. Get up and walk out. Subhanallah. But if they ask you a question that's tough, you look at it and you start sweating and your stomach starts churning. Now you know, oh, oh, there's something happening here, right? So the same would apply in the dunya. Allah says, La kafaru fil bilad. Don't be deceived by the movement of those who don't believe when they are given luxuries and the dunya thrown at their feet. And there are more than one verse that explains this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, don't be deceived by what we've given others. No. It doesn't mean we love them or we like them or whatever. And it's not a sign that Allah doesn't like you either. If you're a mu'min and Allah has blessed you with wealth, well, you need to know. And I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters here. If Allah has blessed you with one thing, people don't know that you have other issues. They don't know that. They think you're set. I mean, you talk about someone, they have the looks, they have the wealth, they have... Uh, 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 what seems to be a lovely family, etc. But you don't know. They might have health matters that you don't know. They might have some other deep burning issues that are worse than yours, but they're hidden from your eye. Allah has promised He's going to test every single one of us. You know, it's called tawqid in the Arabic language, emphasis. Allah says, and verily, definitely, indeed, without a doubt, we are going to test all of you. When Allah says you, he's referring to all of us. With what? Those are the tests, one after the other. In fact, those are only some of the tests Allah makes mention of. And the point that Allah is raising is what is mentioned after that. So Allah will test us with fear, with loss of life, with hunger, with loss of produce, with loss in so many things. And Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin." Give good news to those who are patient, those who are forbearant, those who practice restraint. When we test them, give good news to them. Good news. So, don't think you are the only one going through challenges. Wallahi, we who are seated here are also going through challenges. We also have issues. Some of the issues we face perhaps are bigger than some of those you face. But with Allah, nothing is too big. If you make Allah yours, as in the main focus of your life, trust me, He will make your path easy, so easy. And where do I get this from? So many places in Revelation. Let's start with the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He lost his son. He lost another son. He lost his daughters. He lost his children, one after the other. He lost his spouse. He lost a wife he loved. What did he? The people passed away all around him. He was born. When he was born, he didn't have a father because his father passed away before he was born. Then he was born and his mother passed away. Then his grandfather took over. His grandfather passed away. Then his uncle took over. A day came, the uncle passed away. And the wife passed away. It was known as the year of sadness. But I have no doubt Allah loved him more than entire creation. The year of sadness came to the one whom Allah lo loves more than you and I. So that has nothing to do with, with whether Allah is pleased with you or not. Allah is pleased with those who are close to Him and who try to become even closer. 
try. I said in my talk earlier, what Allah wants from you is to try in the right direction. For as long as you're trying. I spoke about salah. And I want to say it again. None of us will have 100% concentration. No. So don't let that make you think because I can't concentrate, I'm not going to read salah. You know, someone came to me once and said, I can't read salah. Why? I can't fulfill my salah. Because I, I can't remember whether I read one or two or three or four. What did I read? I don't even know. So I said, don't worry. You're supposed to read it even more. <laughs> Subhanallah. Because those better than you had the same problem. What do you mean those better than me had the same problem? So yeah. Didn't you read the hadith? Is إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلَمْ يَدْرِي أَوَاحِدَةً صَلَّ أَمِثْ نَتَيْنِ It's a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, if any, he's telling his companions, if any one of you reads salah and you can't remember whether you read one or two, then this is what you should do. Why? Because it happened at the time. Two people better than you and I, they were sahaba. They also sometimes lost concentration in prayer. They didn't know we did one or two. They had a doubt, do I have wudu, do I not? But they did not let the doubts control them. That's the thing. When you let the doubt control you, you lose focus completely. You become despondent. Don't. Allah is more merciful than your problem. That's why the hadith says, Salli qa'iman fa illam tastati' fa qa'idan fa illam tastati' fa ala jamb. Fulfill your prayer standing in the proper way. If you cannot, then sitting. And if you cannot, then lying down. Why? Because Allah doesn't need that prayer. You need it. So just do it in the best way you can. Try. Same applies to my wudu. I'm going to make it in the best way I can. Not going to lose hope. Anyway, I think I'm sidetracking a little bit from what was uh, the main core of what I was saying. And that is giving you and you having things is not a sign of the pleasure of Allah. Not necessarily, but he could give you sometimes when he knows that perhaps you will do things. And taking away from you is not a sign that Allah is displeased with you. Not at all. It Both of the instances should draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when a person has wealth, if it makes them arrogant and it makes them haughty, it, it's actually a punishment for them. Look at Qarun. When Allah describes Qarun, Allah says we gave him so much. Allah says we gave him so much of wealth that the keys, just the keys to the treasures would be heavy for a group of men to actually carry. Imagine the keys to the treasures. And then Allah says, فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضَ Allah says, him and, and his whole household, his whole house, we caused the earth to swallow it. We sunk him into the ground. So there, was that the pleasure of Allah? And you know what? I must mention this point now that it's come to my mind about Qarun. Allah says, there were people who used to say, Ya layta lana mithlama utiya Qarun. Oh, I, we wish that we had what Qarun has. What did he have? Trust me, he had so much. We just described. He would have been the wealthiest of the lot. If that wealth came with the arrogance of Qarun, it is a punishment. And if it came with the obedience of Sulaiman, it is actually a mercy of Allah. Then when he was swallowed by the ground, you know what? In fact, prior to being swallowed by the ground, the people with knowledge, what did they say? The people with knowledge warned the others to say, hey, 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 be careful. You don't just wish what this person has like that. If it comes with haughtiness and arrogance, it's not a means of the mercy of Allah, or showing the mercy of Allah. So Allah says later on, وَأَصْبَحَ الَّذِينَ تَمَنَّوْ مَكَانَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ يَقُولُونَ وَيْكَأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَقْدِرْ لَوْلَا أَمَّنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا لَخَسَفَ بِنَا الله أكبر Those people who were wishing to have what Qarun had in terms of material wealth, Allah says, you know what? They said later on, and I'm just mentioning a portion of it, just as well we didn't have what Qarun had. Had we had that, Allah would have destroyed us with him as well. So that is actually a proper answer to what we're talking about to say, 
Be happy with what Allah has given you. He knows why He kept you in your place. But one thing, materialism is taking over very fast. People really are following the latest of everything. I may be guilty of that to a certain extent. May Allah guide me. What I mean is, when there's a new phone, we all want to know, hey, what about it? I, oh, Allah, without a joke. There's a new phone, there's a new this, there's a new handbag, there's a new perfume. How does it smell? But sister, you've got 40 perfumes on your dressing table. You've hardly touched them. Subhanallah. Clothing. For every occasion, we need a new pair of clothing. I don't know if that's the culture here. In fact, here, I was told the last time that when you do a photo shoot, at the same function, you need three pairs of clothes. If that is the case, materialism, we are drowning with that. Cut it. That's a sign of the anger of Allah. It's called extravagance. And Allah tells us, <laughs> Indeed, those who are wasteful, extravagant, etc., those who, uh, you know, just spend as they wish and will, that is tabdeer. Those who go beyond the limits, they are the brethren of the devil, of shaitan. And shaitan is ungrateful. That is ingratitude. When Allah gives you money, you know, I thought of this in my talk, but I didn't say it. I'm saying it now. You spent three million naira on an outfit. Halal. Halal. We're not saying it's haram. Do you realize that that means you worked for almost a whole month, depending on your salary, or a few weeks, and all that you sweated. You went to work early, you came back, you went, you sweated, you came back, you did this, you did that, all of that. That amount of time was in lieu for a piece of clothing. You thought of that. We missed our salah. That's what people do when they go to work sometimes. We gave up a lot of our deen, and we earned a little bit saying, I need to earn. And you just bought a piece of clothing, which means put that piece of clothing in front of you and tell yourself, my dhuhr, my asr, my maghrib, my isha, for one month went away because I needed this piece of cloth. Have you ever thought of it that way? Same applies with your car. Look at your car every day and say, I've given up Allah so much, but alhamdulillah, I have a car. A'udhu billah, we wouldn't want to say that. We don't realize when we spend money, even when you eat food, we eat food, we go for a meal, but you don't, you don't know how many 20s make a hundred. You know, that they say how many dollars make a whole hundred. You don't realize, you just spent it, but take a look at who sweated behind the money. How did, that's why the hadith says one of the first things that you are going to be, you know, questioned about. Your salah, yes indeed, and then your money, where did you earn, where did you spend, etc. Where is it? Where is all this sustenance we gave you? It's something you're going to leave behind in the dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from materialism. Don't rush behind that. I tried, I want to give you a small example. Uh, when you get too attached to something and it is coming between you and Allah and your heart is beginning to love it so much that it's now getting between you and Allah, you know what? Cut it. Cut it. And I'm sorry to say one thing. You know, the brothers, we are equally guilty. But with the sisters, look. Everyone wants to look good. Mashallah. Mashallah, you may want to, you know, put your little eyeliner here and there. Look a little bit decent. Perhaps a little bit of a touch-up if you'd like here and there. But, but, never choose your makeup over Allah. Never choose your makeup over Allah. I receive so many questions of people say, how can I make wudu when the value of the Mac that I used on my face is almost a hundred US dollars? I'm sure Allah will allow me to read my Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha late at night. Wallahi, I'm only mentioning this because we receive these questions. So that sister should put the bottle of Mac in front of her and whatever other little fancies you have, put it there and repeat in the mirror, you are more important than salah. Repeat it 10 times. Wallahi, that's what we are doing, but we are not speaking about it in front of the mirror. Wallahi, we are doing it. So 
I respect those who don't waste so much money on that which is the pressure of the world. Be yourself. Islam teaches you to love what Allah has made you with. To love your appearance, to love what Allah has given you. You don't need to hide your identity so much. Like I said, you want to look good a little bit here and there is okay. But so much that you start thinking, subhanallah. We give up Allah because I just want to show my behind. You know, Allah has given me a behind of a good size. A'udhu billah. So I need to show the men. Imagine. Imagine. And what we've done, we've given it. We, th we want the pleasure of Allah that we're talking about. And we say, but you know, I have a problem. What's the problem? Ah, this, but you can't even change your dress for Allah. You can't even make that two inches more. Two inches on either side would have been the most perfect outfit, but you needed it such that you had to show Allahu Akbar. Why? Why? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I hope I've worded it in a way that can convince us just to be better people by the way. And we're not judging anyone. It's only a, a means of encouragement. And for the brothers, wait, your turn is coming. <laughs> Masha Allah, may Allah reward you.